floor and the river. So, but a few years ago, the Coastal Protection and Restoration Authority asked the USGS, could you use those computers, take off everything that's wet? I said, okay. Ooh. That's, that's what happened. This is where we live today. People think, oh yeah, it's a big, no. The rest of this is mostly wetlands. A few people who live there, not many. But some fish and wildlife. And that's why those wetlands are so important. And we're losing them still at a dramatic rate. And if nothing is done, before the end of the century, at current rates of subsidence and sea level rise, we could look like this. Two little fingers of land sticking out to the Gulf of Mexico, hardly speed bumps for storm surge. Now, let's examine how we got to that situation. Let's start with the subsidence, the facts on subsidence. As I'm sure everyone in this room probably knows, this whole landscape, the southern part of Louisiana, the bottom of the boot, most of it, was formed by deltas created by annual floods from the Mississippi River. Big loads of mineral sediments, mineral-based sediments, inches feet in many cases each year, over 7,000 years as the delta flow back, oops, back and forth. All river deltas work this way if they're left in a natural fate. Though the delta gets too high, they have to abandon that delta because gravity is working on going downhill. They move, form another one back and forth. And that's how this whole area was built in the last 7,000 years. By the time New Orleans was founded in 1718, what the river had built was this big, muddy sponge, the bottom third of the state, sitting on this first hard rock. If you go down to the mouth of the river, 70 miles south of here, as pelican flies, you've got to go 400 feet down to get to that rock layer. That rock layer doesn't come above the surface until you get around Baton Rouge. It's about 150 feet below New Orleans. So, There are two ways, two major ways, that a coastal delta can maintain its elevation against the sea. The first, the most important, obviously, the spring floods, right? Every year the river comes up, not just the main stem, all the distributaries, and this distributary system, when we showed up, when our Europeans showed up, was like a big shrimp trawl or spider web that stretched from present-day Mississippi almost to Texas. Every spring, everything overflowed and built what became the Amazon in North America, an estuary 6,000 square miles big. So that is the first way it can maintain its elevation against the sea, because it easily outpaced the rate of sea level rise. The second way is the plant base, 6,000 uh, square miles of plants <clears throat> dropping their stems, their branches, whatever, into the estuary. Botanists call that plant detritus, fancy word for dirt. Plants <clears throat> produce their own soil, basically. Two major ways. Okay. So, why did whoops, why did we lose 2,000 square miles? Most of you know that figure. We've lost 2,000 square miles of our bottom third, mostly wetlands, from 1930 to today a little over 2,000 square miles. How did we lose that in 80 years, bringing the Gulf of Mexico almost within our backyards in many places, especially during hurricanes? Well, <clears throat> everyone knows we built levees. Once Europeans got here, spring floods are great, but they flood fields, they flood towns. So after about 200 years of just rebuilding these levees, Something ha happened called the Great Flood of 27, 1927. I think most of us, Bob was here then. Uh, he's a little <laughs> boy. Uh, that's where he got his first seersucker suit. <laughs> um, so, so they built this. They, the Congress said after that, you know, 740,000 people were homeless. John Barry's book, Rising Tides, great. Anyway, so they said, look, and that was when the population of the country was like 110 million. If you can imagine the scope of that disaster. 
I don't like to use the word natural disasters. There are no disasters in nature, just events. We're there in the way, not paying attention, and so we end up in a disaster. Anyway, so finally that was it, and Congress instructed the Corps of Engineers to build the world's greatest levee system. They did, and they finally finished it around 1933. Well, and that put the river right inside of a pipe, couldn't go back and re resupply the delta with mud, so it's happening. It's going to sink. That was an eventual death sentence, that alone. But, because gravity is always pressing down, right, squeezing that sponge against that immovable rock. So it's going to sink, always. And eventually it would go below the surface of the Gulf of Mexico. That's what it looked like in the spring now, every year, since those levees went up. All that mud, the, the gray spot, oh, yeah, okay, that's work. All that was the mud that used to go here, 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 all up in there. Just goes off the mouth of the river where, of course, now it's the engine for the dead zone. We won't go into that right now. But, wait a minute. If that's all we had done, is put levees on the river, finish them, cut off the distributary, except for the Atchafalaya in the 30s, would probably, the wetlands that were in extent then, would probably largely in extent today. How do we know that? Well, because in the past, how did we lose 2,000 square miles Normally, when the river abandoned its deltas naturally in the past, it took centuries, if not millennia, for these things to sink, break apart, and finally be covered by the fact that St. Bernard Delta was abandoned 2,000 years ago, there's still a lot of that left. So something else must have happened to take a process that should have taken centuries or even millennia and compress it into 80 years of single human lifetime. Something else did. See, that's the St. Bernard Delta 200 years ago. Still a lot of that left, not much, thanks to Mr. Go and other things. But well, something else did happen. Ironically, about the same time those levees were finished, oil and gas was discovered in our coastal zone. Eventually, 50,000 wells were drilled in our coastal zone. This is almost 90% privately owned. There are no protection for wetlands. Many, if not most, of those oil and gas wells were accessed by canals. This is from the USGS. It's a data map of the oil and gas infrastructure in Louisiana. You can see the southern third of the state. Every one of those yellow and red dots is an active or inactive oil and gas well. These blue lines are the pipes, 110,000 miles of pipes crossing out coast because there's 50% of the nations for finding capacity here, mainly between Baton Rouge and New Orleans, <coughs> west over to Lake Charles, <coughs> excuse me, the other half is over in Texas. So eventually, 10,000 miles of canals were dredged to access this oil and gas infrastructure. Ten thousand miles of canals. These canals average 110 to 125 feet wide, 10, 15, 20 feet deep. These canals are coming off natural waterways connected to the Gulf of Mexico and its coastal estuary. Those waterways, natural waterways, are influenced by Gulf tides. That means salt, salt water content is coming from the natural waterways into these canals, into the freshwater areas, killing the plants, holding the shorelines together. <clears throat> Studies at LSU said just dredging these canals turned 11% of the surface area of the plant community to open water, and damage didn't stop there because of the erosion that took place. We also know in places where there was the greatest amount of extraction of oil and gas, we had the greatest amount of subsidence. These canals did something else, as you can see. When you dredge a canal, you know the canal unless you do something with the mud you're digging up, they call it spoil, they put it on either side of the left of the canals as they're dredging them. If you've got 10, we think probably 15,000 miles of canals, you've got 30,000 miles of spoil levees, 5 to 10 yards wide, 5, 10, 15 feet high, tens of millions of tons of mud on top of that sponge, compressing the upper layers, destroying some of the high subsurface hydrology that can keep 
the wetlands hydrated, and if they were impounded in huge areas, what happens when you impound an area of wetlands with a levee? The inside sinks even faster. Here in New Orleans, we know that, right? The Delta is a, a part of the wetland. We've encircled New Orleans completely with levees, and that's why we have some parts of the city that are 25 feet below sea level. Our roads look like Michaelopolis paintings. Um, so, this is, those are mostly what's left here, the spoil levees. This is Golden Meadow. This was all swamp into the 40s when the oil and gas industry moved in there. This was high land, a natural levee. There were cotton fields. I have pictures of cotton fields down here in 1938. There's no hydroponic cotton. The only thing that's left that looks like bones in the graveyard are the spoil levees. By the 1970s, when I was in my 20s, uh, uh, <laughs> we were losing 50 square miles a year of our bottom third. <laughs> New Orleans has 350 square miles, 50 square miles a year. So, I mean, that's, that would be wiped out in five years. I've been fortunate enough these wetlands have been my office and my playground, and really my church most of my life. Um, it's been a place of, of also great sorrow and frustration uh, because I watched as it was destroyed at a sickening pace. It's hard to imagine 50 square miles, but if I didn't go out there every few months, especially after a, a hurricane, you would see dramatic changes. But you go out constantly, you're fishing, you're duck hunting, you're bird watching or whatever, and you notice that things are falling apart. These big marsh islands are getting, they're breaking into pieces and getting smaller. And they're still dredging. You're out there in your duck pond. Every year you have to, you know, you, you duck, in the old days you built your, your, your duck blind on the shore. But every few years, suddenly you were five feet out in the middle of the pond. The marsh had receded. Five yards, ten yards further back, your little duck pond connected with another one, it was a lagoon. A lagoon connected with another one, now it's a lake. This is a Big Cat Island in 1998. It used to be a mile long and broke up into small pieces. By now it was like 300 yards long and 50 yards wide. I always fish there a lot. A friend of mine was fishing in this boat. I have a GPS in my boat that picture. We fished there a lot, but it was still a great spot. That's what it looked like eight years later. It was gone the next year. I have a picture of my wife standing on some of the shells uh, after Katrina. That's all that's there. We know from research at LSU, you know, which is a football team with a university attached to North here. Um, no, it's a great research university, especially in these areas. 2,000 square miles we've lost. It's 30 to 60 percent of that loss is due to oil and gas work. In some places, obviously, it's like 90 percent. So, you know, I just want to ask people to stop. I even have arguments with the paper and the headline writers. Stop using the word Louisiana's wetlands are disappearing or vanishing. That implies some kind of a gentle natural process. It's just kind of fading away into the future. That hasn't happened. It's been, it's been nothing gentle about this. Uh, we destroyed it. It wasn't pretty or gentle. It was violent and ugly process. I witnessed it. We strip mined them, dredged them and tossed them aside, drained them, suffocated them with subdivisions and factories, shopping centers, playgrounds, even golf courses. And now we're drowning them. So please don't say, don't let anyone use that word about disappearing. We've destroyed them and we have to take responsibility for that. Certainly in 1980, this process was well known. Great biologists were doing work warning the nation about what was to happen, what was happening, warning the state, the state didn't care at all. 
So, what happened was, after we destroyed the hydrology of this area and shut it off, first shut it off from a resupply of sediment, and then began destroying the plant base, and then the hydrology, and then extracting in the shallower areas, oil and gas, we're left with a habitat that has an average elevation of two and a half feet. There are some places here that have been sinking for decades at the rate of an inch every 30 months. That's 18 inches in 50 years, three feet in a century. And there's no cure for subsidence other than we'll all move and tear the levees down. Uh, and, and that might not be enough right now either, but and that's been suggested in the past, especially after we have a hurricane, you know. Remember after Katrina, the stupid suggestions, why do they live there? After a Superstorm Sandy hit, I was being interviewed uh, by Public Radio International. You know, you guys have been through this. What was your thought saying that? I just couldn't resist. So, I said, Yo, why do they live there? They had a hurricane three years ago. Anyway. Um, so, we destroyed the hydrology of our landscape, and now, because of the levees, almost as importantly, if that's all we had done, we'd still have a lot of weapons left, but then we didn't, oil and gas came in. By the way, all these, the 10,000 miles of canals, that's measured from 72. Before that, no one needed a permit. It was private land, no one cared about weapons. After 72, the Clean Water Act was passed in 72. And that included a section saying, you can't destroy weapons even on private lands. This was a very popular bill. It was passed by both houses. There was something going on then called by, um, by part. <laughs> I can't remember it. By part. <laughs> anyway, uh, signed by a Republican president. Um, so we know since then 10,000 miles were permitted. These permits, by the way, said when you're finished, you've got to fill these canals and return to your permits the way you found it. That was never enforced by the state or federal government. All right, let's move on to that second fact of why we're doomed, unless something changes, and that is sea level rise. The Gulf of Mexico is rising at a modern record pace that will increase dramatically in the decades ahead. Why? It's climate change. This is really not rocket science. If it was, I couldn't be writing about it, I can assure you. It's simple to understand and to prove. Humans have been pumping greenhouse gases, primarily emissions from fossil fuels, into the atmosphere since about the 1850s. The gases collect in the atmosphere, trapping heat in the atmosphere. The oceans have been absorbing that extra heat, 90% of it, for 170 years. What happens to water when you warm it? it Remember high, you know, high school chemistry class, right? It expands, raising the volume of the oceans. Here's another tricky one. What happens to water stored as ice on land when you Warn it. No. It's amazing. It's tricky science. <laughs> and then it, well, gradually it runs downhill going into the same pot of water, the ocean, further increasing sea level rise. How do we know that happens? That's what's, these are the, this is what sea level have been doing over the centuries. Bob can see when. If I was a boy, <laughs> obviously this is a terrible thing. You can check out, one way we've been counting this, for, usually we only did it, we could do it very easily by checking records at tide stations. There are tide stations at every port in the country, around the world almost, and someone at each of those places or some instruments been recording high tide every day for decades, sometimes a century. Not typical science. If you take a measure of the same thing at the same place every day for a decade or a century, you can get a little chart going. 
and it will show you what's going on. And you can see what's happening. All these arrows are going up. Well, almost all of them. Why are they coming down in some places? That's where President Trump owns land. <laughs> no, that's because of something called post-glacial rebound. You can take millions of tons of ice off a landscape. It's like getting off a memory, memory foam mattress, only much slower. You get this rebound. It, depending on what's under there and how fast it goes, some of these are getting shorter as sea levels rising. In fact, all of central Canada is still rising because that's where the glaciers stopped at the end of the last ice age. But you can notice the arrows all look pretty much the same until you get down here to South Louisiana. The average, that's uh, actually global. This is from Charleston, and that's pretty much what the average is right now across the East Coast and Gulf Coast. 3.36 millimeters a year. Sea level rise is never linear, right? It's not the same, the same place even day to day. There are lots of different factors we want to get to those weeds, but that's why you do these trends, right? Over When you get this much data over decades or a century, yeah, there's definitely a trip. Let's go to Grand Isle as a tide station, one of the most famous in the world for climatologists. The Coast Guard station on the east end of the island. Nine, now 9.16 millimeters a year. Why is Louisiana's, when you add what's happening on land relative to what's happening on the sea, it's called relative sea level rise. What's happening on our land? That's why sea level rise is three times higher in coastal Louisiana than it is in the rest of the nation. And that's why we're in big trouble. The world's smartest people on this subject <laughs> say, and they're not politicians, so maybe I should say the second smartest people in the world. Um, and they don't walk, work in the oil and gas industry. Um, they spend their lives studying this stuff. And they say now, at the current rates of sea level rise, in subsidence, relative sea level rise, this was out maybe a month ago, coastal Louisiana is likely to see two feet of sea level rise by 2050. That's not the end of the century. Remember when these projections first came out 10 years ago? Oh, it's, I can't worry about what's going to happen in 80 years. No, that's 30 years, basically, from now. Two feet. Four feet by the end of the century at current projections. And by the way, the projections that have been being used by the smartest people in the world, the mid-level projections, they take all these readings, they try to hit a sweet spot in the middle, not off one end, not too high, not too low. That been wrong. It's been much higher than it's been projected in each one of these reports. And sadly, it's only going to get a lot worse. All this is because global warming. It's about emissions. <coughs> it's going to get a lot worse because now the ice sheets, the miles thick ice sheets in Greenland and Antarctica are melting at the fastest rates since records have been kept. Antarctica has 30% of the world's freshwater supply frozen, 30%. And the ice sheets that prevent warm water from hitting the glaciers that are on land are melting. These ice sheets melting and falling apart don't affect sea level rise because they're already in water. Okay, It's like an ice cube in water. Their vital function is preventing warm water from getting under the bottom of the foot of these glaciers. And it's just like our levees preventing storm surge. These ice sheets are like levees. When they're gone, the warm water comes right in the water down there is getting warmer right against the glacier, 
So it moves even faster into the ocean, and that's extra water. It's like turning a faucet on in a bathtub that's already full. Okay, when that happens. And really scarily, in the last two weeks, there's been research published that shows that we're really in danger of seeing a lot of these ice fields, ice sheets in West Antarctica falling apart at the fastest rates that have been <coughs> seen. So it's all about emissions. This is the water temperature in the Gulf of Mexico in the summer now. <laughs> Jeez, whoops. Um, I mean, this is unheard of. It used to 80, 85 maybe. Now it's routinely breaking records. So now you're probably wondering, what about our wonderful coastal master plan? Well, it is a great plan. But it's going to have to make some pretty radical changes to keep up with what's been happening, just what's been discovered that's happening in the, and is actually happening in the last 10 years. Let me explain. When this plan was first developed in 2007 by our own great coastal scientists and help from around the world, um, they were charged with coming up. The Coastal Protection and Restoration Authority was founded. These scientists were finally you know, charged with give us a holistic plan, an ecosystem wide plan that we can maybe stay here. Because now, Katrina's taught even the most recalcitrant that these wetlands are important. And they did. They came up with a plan. 50-year plan, $50 billion, natural uh, inflation makes it $92 billion. Um, they said we really need $200 billion, but $50 billion is going to be a, a stretch. Um, half the money is going to go to structural protection for coastal communities for storm surge. The other half will be used to try to hold on to some of the weapons we have left, rebuild some of those that are close uh, to sediment uh, sources. Anyway, they put all this stuff, the plan, into their big computers, and the computer said, if you build those on time, and timing's important. Why? Because the holes we have to fill are getting deeper and wider every day. If you build all these projects on time, by 2067, you can build, be building more land in aggregate than you're losing. I mean, this was like incredible news. Well, yay! Let's have a parade. Uh, we can live here, we can stay here, we can turn this equation around. This was just a watershed, oh, that's a bad word, watershed moment. Maybe. It's a, it was a transformative moment. It really gave people who knew about this problem uh, some hope. This is adaptive management, it has to be. We're learning stuff every day. Uh, so every five years they redo the plan. In 2012, the computer said the same thing. Build these projects on time. You can turn the equation around. Well, yay! Let's have two parades in the Zulu Coconut. 2017 came along, and the computer said, See, these, this is the master plan, basically. You've read a lot about it, diversions, marsh creation, and, and we're really moving forward on a lot. 2017, the computer said, Meh. You can't do that anymore. Even if you get the money, even if you build all the projects on time and they work perfectly, by 2067, you're going to lose at least another 1,200 square miles. Best case. Worst case, you could lose another 2,800 square miles. That's amazing. And by the way, you need another chapter of many billions to help people move because there's no way to save them. What was the difference? Sea level rise projections. The worst case for sea level rise in the 2012 plan was now the best case in the 2017 plan. Why? Because we had better science. They were rising faster than we thought. And the emissions were rising faster than we thought they would. This is a uh, I don't know if it's going to work here, huh? Um, maybe it will. This is a um, animation. I don't know if it works. Whoop. I don't think it's going to work. Yeah. You have to click it onto the computer. How do I?
how do I click it on the computer? With the mouse. With the mouse. Okay, there it goes. So this is from Todd Gates records all over the world going back to 1880. As I said, sea level rise is never linear for lots of different reasons. But watch the speed of this when you get to around 2010. Watch how fast it accelerates. Even now, watch this. It's all about emissions. Best case scenario, 1,200 square miles gone, is if the Paris Climate Accords are working. The worst case is what happens if Paris fails. Paris is failing. Paris isn't coming close. To show you how terrible that is, this is from the 2017 master plan that our scientists put together and presented to our well, GOP dominated legislation, which approved it unanimously, which I would think means they believe it, right? They put their name on this, they agree with the science. Our scientists say that if the Paris Accords are working, we're still going to lose everything in red. There are a lot of people and businesses there. That's what happens if Paris fails, and it's failure. I mean, there are a lot of businesses, there's a lot of oil and gas infrastructure, there are a lot of communities. They'll be underwater, not by 2200. I mean, 2100. You're talking in 50 years, not even 50 years, up like 30, what, 32 years, 38 years. That's, where, that's what's happening right now. Um, it's not going to get any better. The science, trying to cover this story, keep up with it, even with two columns a month in speaking engagements, is, is like covering a, really a, an ongoing sporting event to make it war. I mean, this changes every day. Um, and from the time I started writing this talk, uh, maybe a week ago, I had to keep changing things because the news kept changing and, and it wasn't good. But Last year, the CPRA had to submit, submitted an EIS, Environmental Impact Statement, for the first diversion, the mid-barritary mid vertical diversion. And everyone was celebrating because it looked like it was going to get, it was meeting all the problems that uh, the permitting agencies had set out had to be solved. But inside that document, something that didn't get the attention it deserved, it was reported, their computers showed Originally, they said mid barataria could, well, eventually they said that mid barataria could rebuild 32 square miles in that area by 26, or 27, 2067, actually. You know, that's one reason to do it, right? To spend $1.3 billion um, because it could keep building land forever. That information was collected several years ago. You know, there's this big lag time, unfortunately. No way to get around it. The science, you get science changes, just like I'm trying to write about, these scientists, researchers get the latest information <laughs> and they put it into all of their plans. It takes maybe a couple of years to get those plans finalized, and by then, a lot of the data they're using to justify their projections are out of date. They updated it for this EIS, and they had to say that um, by 2070, we'll be losing. A lot of the land we built in 2050 with this diversion because sea level rise is happening that much faster. And just, so what, what are we doing about this? IPCC said last week, I guess it was, 10 days ago, that the world has to prevent the worst impacts from hitting over the next decades, three or four decades, to reach the Paris Accord targets, the world will have to reduce, has eight years to reduce current emissions in half. This is before the war in Ukraine.
all these reports, all research, what's great about being this research, the abstract, I mean, oh my God, this is terrible news. But it's cause and effect, right? So you know that the effect is usually in the abstract, but the causes are in the paper. And the solutions are there if you read them, right? You just address the causes to reduce the effects. And so they have lasted steps. They said, look, we can do this. World, we can do this if we get together. Switch to renewable fuels. That's the number one thing. Make buildings more efficient. People are, buildings breathe, just like your house breathes, skyscrapers breathe, and they're filled, filled with methane and other types of um, gases, uh, greenhouse emissions. And they come out, come out of the windows, out of the smokestacks, and that is a big problem. Half the world's people, I think, now live in urban areas. It's a big problem. And so we used to just focus on, on uh, power plants and cartel pipes, and those are obviously big contributors, but buildings are just as important. We've got to address that. Um, turn cities green, kind of for the same reason. Have more green space, have more trees, um, use uh, different types of energy. The energy grid has to be changed to renewables that don't produce these types of gases. Use electric vehicles, walk, bike to places, don't use your car as much if you don't have an electric or a hybrid. Um, carbon capture has a role uh, if they can ever figure out how to do it on a grand scale. Um, invest, it's another thing that we ignore, half the world, or more than half the world is poor. They still burn wood, okay? Uh, we have to address these poorer countries to help them modernize, uh, to, to fund them, uh, to move to and help them provide and build renewable energy. Uh, agriculture also has to be addressed. Uh, food production, food waste is a huge uh, contributor to climate change. So all these things. And the IPCC, the smartest people in the world on this subject, says if we do this quickly, we have a chance of reaching that goal and preventing, you know, two feet or three feet of sea level rise in coastal Louisiana by 2050. Um, even if it doesn't work completely, we need to have these efforts because it'll give us time for technology to come up with some other solutions that could work. You know, right now we're just, it, it'll give us time to build, if nothing else, to build higher levees, taller flood walls, pour more mud from the river into sinking basins. It'll give us more time. Right now we're losing this battle. We're running out of time even to build these diversions. In fact, if nothing changes, and I'll talk about that in a second, the master plan is going to change dramatically. You know, climate scientists are now calling what's happening, and we're seeing it. If you read the paper, if you've lived, if you live here, especially in the last few years, that the heating is causing cumulative impacts. That's how one anthropomorphic change can set off a whole series of dominoes that keep building on each other. This is happening, now this is happening. You know, they talk about the web of life and you pull one string and it has these ripples throughout the whole thing. This is happening now in our climate. We didn't, this is still a mystery, unfortunately. Well, a lot of it's being exposed now, but you know, we don't know everything about nature and the climate and the planet. We're discovering new things really every day. It's this wonderful, beautiful mystery that we're, we're, we're discovering and there are all these feedbacks that we want to wear. Some of them are positive, but a lot of them are negative. For example, in our case, what faces coastal Louisiana, it all starts with heating. Recent research that was published really about three months ago found that half by 2014, half of the world's oceans had passed a tipping point where they're now staying in record high temperatures for what they have been historically. In the case of the Gulf of Mexico, that means we're seeing water caps above 85 degrees close to land during the summer during hurricane season. 
And water temperatures are like crystal meth to hurricanes. Right? They can turn a Cat 1, a meager Cat 1, into a raging Cat 4 in 24 hours. We saw that last year. We've seen that at least four times in the U.S. in the last five years. Why? Because record high water temperatures. It's like throwing gas on a fire. You know, for that matter, just a few millimeters increase in sea level rise. People say, oh, you know, it's, it's just 10 millimeters. Imagine adding that much water across a wide space of the Gulf of Mexico. What does that do? That means your storm surge is higher. It's coming ashore with more energy. It's reaching further inland, even if you weren't sinking, but you're also getting lower. More heat means more evaporation of water in the ocean. That collects into more and larger thunderstorms, which create record rainfalls. Houston, Baton Rouge, Covington, Tangipahoa. All, most of the record rainfalls we've had in this state, this part of the state, have happened in the last five to six years. The ocean's getting warmer. That's another cumulative impact. Researchers now think there's a link between tornadoes, especially those occurring later, like in the winter, what would be the winter down here, and the warmer uh, Gulf of Mexico, because moisture in the air is a critical component of creating wind shear and thunderstorms, the type of wind shear that can lead to the circulation that creates tornadoes. More frequent flooding in the city, this city, other cities, into cars and homes means higher insurance rates. We're now screaming about uh, the subsidized insurance that we get is going to be higher. Then you have to think, I mean, right now, as I understand it, new home buyers are having a hell of a time finding homeowners insurance. The big companies don't want to write here anymore because we've gone from, you know, the, the big easy to the big risky. <laughs> Higher golf, tall storm surge, heat feeds rapid growth from Cat 1 to Cat 5. The CPRA says, this is our Louisiana coastal scientists say that major storms we're likely to increase 13 to 18 percent over the next 50, 83 percent, 82 percent over the next 50 years. Um, record rainfalls and the links to tornadoes. We've gone from the big easy to the big risky. Imagine, whoops, let me get back here. Uh, what does this do to the business atmosphere here? You know, after Hurricane Saint Hurricane Andrew. Yeah. Hit Florida, what, in the 80s maybe it was? 92. 92, thank you. There was a huge migration of businesses. Well, they closed, basically, and others moved. There were manufacturing businesses that, that produced pieces that were used in factories in other states. Uh, they had an inexpensive labor force. They could do this. Well, what happens if you're making widgets in Louisiana for some company in Indiana. And they say, wait a minute, you, you're closing down for another evacuation? Wait a minute, the power's out for two weeks? I need these widgets to meet the orders I've got from this other company. I'm sorry, I've got to look for a manufacturer that's not in South Louisiana. What happens, what business wants to move here if they know they may have to be evacuating once or twice every every late summer and fall. Try to get insurance on your factory here. Wait a minute. They've got record rainfalls. They can't get insurance. Well, I can't. So that's happening. There's going to be a migration of businesses out of this place that are here now, and it's going to be really hard to bring someone in, facing all those risks that we now face today. It's here now, investors are paying attention. Um, I'm not optimistic any of that stuff will get done, because really, it can't be done without, on this timeline, this deadline, right? There are no timeouts without government regulations. 
It's going to take government action to have this problem addressed in a swift manner. It takes political commitment nationally and locally. One party, I mean, the Republican Party just isn't having any of it. I mean, that's the fact. You can go check the votes. You can check the votes of the Republicans elected from this state to Congress, and they vote against emission regulations. Their own, the, the state plan, the science from the state, approved unanimously by the legislature, says without emissions, this place is doomed by 2067. But the people we keep electing are doing just the opposite. You know, I, I have a lot, of, obviously, a lot of conservative friends, and I said, you know, why? What's inconsistent about being pro-gun, pro-life, and pro-business and pro-environment? Why can't you be all four if you want to live here? Uh, you know, it's it's kind of like going to the hospital. Now they're into uh, carbon. Okay, well, carbon capture. That's the answer. It was a year and a half ago, Garrett Graves, who ran this program and did a hell of a job while he was in charge of it with Governor Jindal, he said, made the statement, it's, and he's considered a Republican congressman who's uh, on the ball on climate change. And he said, you know, it, it's not the oil, it's the emissions. <laughs> That's like saying it's not the cigarettes, it's the smoke. <laughs> so now they're all in carbon capture. They want to cap. We get, you know, that's, that's, you know, there was a, uh, I was reading a book about Winston Churchill, and he, you know, a very clever guy, and he was had an issue, but he thought people were wasting their time with their solutions. Said it's, it's like standing in a bucket and pulling on the handle of trying to gain elevation. Um, <laughs> that's basically what they're trying to do by focusing on carbon capture. Now, we've got to move away from producing. It's like showing up in a hospital right with a severed artery. I can believe you that. And the doctor comes in. I'm not going to sew you up. I'm just going to hook you over the transfusion. Eventually, you're going to run out of blood, right? It's just going in and coming out. So. Uh, there are conservative that are environmental friendly. There are green Republicans out there. People in the state uh, have to find them, get them nominated, get them elected. Uh, otherwise, we're just going to continue to vote to drown. And don't tell me, you know, I hear so many people who I know are conservatives say, oh, he doesn't represent me. Yes, they do. They get elected. It's representative government. And I'm only talking about, don't misunderstand, I'm just talking about this one issue. I'm not talking about all the other disagreements. I'm just talking about this one existential issue. Um, and also, the CPRA's got to make some changes because it's obvious now that sea level rise is rising much faster than they expected. And my guess is that. Uh, in eight years, we're still on time because of the deep water horizon. We're still financially able to continue on. But they've been very honest about what, what results, what science is telling them, and, um, and what they can do. They've already taken some projects off the board. And my guess is that they're going to be taking off a lot more. They have to begin searching for Plan B. Uh, there was some uh, research. There was a big design competition uh, done three or four years ago, um, with teams from all over the world, and they came up with, it's called Changing Course, you can look it up, and basically, they were, a, their, their, their charge was, if you didn't have to worry about money or politics, social politics or governmental politics, no funding restraints, what would you, what's the best thing to do, given the age of sea level rise and we're sinking, and the two winners both said, forget all these diversions everywhere, Move the mouth of the river further north. One, one of them said the English term. Um, that way you'll have all the sediment in the river right there. You'd dredge, you'd dredge 
a different shipping channel, right, for the port. They just go off either the Barataria Bay or Mississippi Sound. Remember, there are no restrictions on money. Um, and then you could focus, there's still enough sediment to keep up with even, the, you know, eight feet by the end of the century if you focus it in one area. Okay, so you focus the sediment here, create a delta that would last about 10 years, great fishing, production, some storm surge, then you keep moving it. But they're, in their estimation, the two winners, there's no way we can keep up with that plan by trying to have diversions. And then other people say, just move all the diversions for enough. The bottom line is, we got to move these people. Because everything below US 90, maybe I 10, doesn't have much of a future. So they have to make changes. And then what can we do individually? People always ask me that. Um, you know, what can I do individually? And what I tell them all, I say, join the Republican Party and change it. <laughs> I'm serious. Nothing's going to get done unless, and they're getting even more radical. It's, it's become a, 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 a tribal thing, you know? We don't believe in science. We don't believe in masks. We don't believe, it's, and it's, it's been framed of us against them. They want to make my life tougher. I mean, it's just not working. And that's the only way to make it work. On this issue, it's the only issue I'm talking about. Uh, locally, there, if you can go online, and there are lots of really good pieces on, on uh, what you can do individually. And it, you can obviously you get a, a, a hybrid electric car, use your bike more, a switch from a gas uh, oven to a um, the magnets oven. So I'm trying to think of what it is. So yes. I'm Induction. induction ovens, uh, use your bike more, don't, uh, don't use plastic at all, everything should be recyclable, buy less, conserve electricity, put the thermostat up a little in the summer, um, uh, use your fans, there are lots of things you can do individually. Will, will that make a difference? No. no, but it will show other people that you care about this issue. No. And if you all work together, you can make it. A difference because this is not going to go away, and I feel really bad for the people in the back of the room. Thank you. Because we're leaving, giving them a really bad deal. We have to live with this. And um, on the other hand, I'd like to say to you people in the back of the room, you know, when I was up about your age, there were lots of causes I felt I could make a difference. Journalism was one of them. It was corruption in politics, racism. We had the civil rights. Movement, the, the, the last one. We had an anti war movement. We had the new environmental movement. Louisiana is producing great university researchers here, research centers. If you want to make a difference on the planet, this is where you want to be. We're actually exporting some of the solutions we've found. We're basically the test lab for what all the other coastal cities are going to experience. We're way, we, we had a big lead on these other cities. We're still ahead of a lot of them. And so there's great opportunity here if you want your life to make a difference for your communities and for mankind. But you gotta like risk. If you don't like risk, move to Kansas. Um, but, but I'd like to leave everyone with this because it's a depressing topic. When I first started talking about coastal challenges 10 years ago, it stopped at the big issue was money. Can we get enough money? doesn't matter now. If we don't find enough money, in eight years if we haven't solved the emissions problem, it won't matter if we find the money. So I like to leave all these talks with my favorite quotation from the Dalai Lama. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone in this room needs to be a coastal mosquito. You need to get out there and bother like hell, do your thing, Talk to other people. Don't yell at them or call them names. Just explain why you're doing it. Maybe they'll ask questions. Even your family. Um, you know, this is important to us. That's all you have to say. And, and tell them why. And that's all I got to say. And I'm sticking to it. <laughs> Questions, sure. Questions. Okay, um, since we have this stream, we're going to.
going to ask you to speak into the microphone, and we have a student that's going to walk around. So just raise your hand if you have a, a question, Jihad. So Yes. Make sure it's on. Okay. 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 It's not on? Oh, okay. Hi, I'm Marianne Momis. I just wanted to tell you uh, something. Thank you for your life. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'm glad I have it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, I've been watching you my whole life. I grew up in New Orleans East. I saw the, the cypress trees forest fade away as my dad took me fishing. Um, this has been uh, an incredible issue for me um, as a healthcare provider, caring for human life, seeing the natural world all around just disappear. And, um, You've, you've spent your entire life developing this issue and making it just known throughout the world. And it just, it means so much to the people who live here and the passion that is in this room and that we feel from you um, and the pain and suffering that you have undergone in just committing yourself to this topic is just unbelievably commendable. Well, thank you, but we need to also thank the Times Picayune um, and the Lens and NPR. Uh, you know, the Times Picayune um, became a very good paper around 1980, 81, <clears throat> which fortunately was about the same time <clears throat> I decided I had enough of locker rooms and wanted to do some kind of an outdoor environmental uh, project. And so they supported me tremendously. And then, of course, they hired Mark Slusty, who's done a fabulous job ever since as the environmental writer. So thank you so much. It's good to hear that it makes a difference. It, you know, most of the, the emails I get are, are from people who have a different point of view. Um, <laughs> <laughs> a couple of the guys, a guy, I have a, a running, I try to befriend them in some way. And so the, the, the insults become kind of jokes. But uh, I wish I could say it made, it's made a difference. Um, I just keep seeing the same people being elected. Uh, to, sent to Baton Rouge. Uh, you know, my last column, um, you know, they spend all their time, they're so enraged about how the history of slavery is taught. Or whether you can use a certain pronoun. And, and we're sinking, and we're going to drown, and there'll be no place to live here for these kids. And and it, but that you know, websites tell you what people are thinking. The Times speaking the newspaper itself today. Mark has a story on well, the two two feet by twenty fifty. The print edition that's there in the front because the editors say this is the most important news this community needs to know. The website is run. Our clicks. So the website will have, I don't know, Drew Brees took his toenails. Um, <laughs> there was a new giraffe at the zoo. Murders, any murder, any violent crime, sex of any kind, you know. And so that tells you what the people who were looking at this online, so it, it's, it's, it's frustrating, but thank you so much. I'm glad to know. And, you know, it, we just need to get that. Uh, this, this, this idea that if you're conservative, you can't be pro-environment. That's, that's crazy. And, and conservatives were the founders. Some of the biggest, I mean, Teddy Roosevelt, um, you know, the original Bob Marshall, um, Carhartt. I mean, I don't think Aldo Leopold was a raging socialist. Um, so uh, we need to convince these people. And there's some groups, uh, Theodore Roosevelt Conservation Partnership, um, backcountry hunters and anglers who are doing really good work in the, in the conservative areas, um, getting good bills passed on conservation. But where they're not getting it done, uh, where the big resistance is, is on climate change emissions because of what funds the people mention. It's a guy who makes 500, he's a, obviously a Democrat, 
he, he makes a half a million dollars a year from coal investments. The, the, the power, the, the uh, clean power plan that was Biden was trying to bring back, he's basically stopping it. Because if he, coal, the use of coal has to be in any pl power plants going forward. So, I mean, you know, um, so that's got to be done. But thank you very much. Any one question in the back? Oh, yeah. Do you mind bringing it up to the nobody's going to read it, and especially people with differing views are actually not going to read it. So what kind of difference are we actually going to make if we can't change people's minds? Maybe you can't change them here. I might, and when I wrote a couple of, you know, I think I had a column a couple of months ago, at the beginning of the year, I'm cautiously pessimistic about the future of the coastal zone. And uh, the reason I was, had held up some hope, one of the reasons is because of young people your generation and younger. Yeah. No. Uh, no, and there's some watching, uh, drinking a beer and watching it on, on YouTube. Um, because they do care, and uh, they care a lot. And so, you know, I don't think it's, uh, if they go out and vote, it could make a big difference. But I, I think uh, in different parts of, this, uh, of the country, I know that a lot of people read it because there are so many, um, environmental newsrooms, if you want to say that, uh, online. They're online environmental newsrooms. One of which is one I think two publishers now, Inside Climate News. Um, a lot of um, think tanks, a lot of advocacy groups have their own websites where they produce news. Uh, it, it has its own um, slant to it in that case, but the major uh, newspapers in the country spend a lot of time on this now. And they wouldn't be doing that. Well, they do it because that's the news judgment. I mean, as a journalist, you hopefully, um, you know, the editor, actually the outgoing uh, executive editor of the New York Times, Dean Bakke, is a New Orleanian. He started at the state time with me, along with, believe it or not, it was quite a class, um, Walter Isaacson, <laughs> Jim Amos, um, Bakke, a couple other guys who went on to pretty amazing things. Um, the new editor, by the way, of the Advocate Pick You is a loyal graduate. Ooh, Renee Lopez. Renee Sanchez. And Sanchez, well, <laughs> him too. Uh, <laughs> Renee Sanchez, right. He started at the Pick You. So, um, so no, I think it makes a difference. And if you just keep on and on without being insulting, I do op-eds now, right? So it's not really journalism. I'm old and journalism's hard, as you guys know. It's like science, it takes a lot of work and I have too many other things I need to do while I can still do them. But, um, uh, I, yeah, it's depressing right now in this area. But it doesn't mean uh, your generation isn't paying attention. And I think as your group gets older and begins taking part in the political process, I think we'll see a lot of good changes here. I don't know if it'll happen in time to prevent some of the stuff hitting us um, before over the next 10 or 20 years, but I think it could have a big impact going forward. And uh, obviously, if you go to other parts of the country where audiences are more receptive, I think people are going to have to start voting that way. Uh, because they're going to have to start addressing the causes. You know, Florida, should mention, it's a whack of a state, but um, they, they just spent, this is a state previously, the previous governor, for about a year and a half, state agencies could not use the words climate change or global warming in any official documents. I mean, what is that all about? Well, they're now realizing that they have all these problems. They have some great research universities, and so now they're saying, yeah, sea level rise is a real problem. So they're spending, I think, $300 million now on adaptation. They're not, but their fight, they will not address the causes. They the, the political powers in the state. Now we don't need to reduce emissions. We just need to build higher levies and flood walls. 
that's obviously a, a waste of money. You're just going to have to keep rising and raising and raising. So don't be discouraged. I know, I wish I could end it on a happier note. <laughs> Um, so I know she did include me in this pessimism, but I'm also <laughs> I'm also a psychology major. Um, so I wonder, in your personal opinion, um, why is there a lack of climate empathy for people, um, especially for voters, more conservative voters, for people like the native tribes or um, other people who live along the bayou? Um, do you think that it comes from like? Big oil propaganda, or is it just? Well, first like, of all, let me let me kind of back up on that. Okay. <laughs> People who live along the bayous have been in the oil business for forty years. Okay. There are no fishing villages. That's all from Hollywood fifty years ago. There are still some people who make most of the living from fishing, but a lot of them were shrimpers when they went on the rigs. I was doing it, uh, working on a, a documentary that these people were doing. And we, we went down to Coquitry to meet with some people. And there was a, a fellow from uh, Panachin, a Native American. There was an African American guy who uh, was a community organizer. There was a young woman uh, from Chauvin who was actually now a, a docent at, a, at a, uh, an art gallery there. And there was a, another guy, a woman, like a baby. She had been, her family had been in, in fishing. So I was asking them, you know, have, what changes have you seen? Oh, you know, by the way, those areas, Cocody, Montague, those places are just basically empty. People had, had to move north, right? Because uh, they kept getting flooded. Oh, yeah, the marshes, uh, they're just, it's all open water. It's, well, so I was saying, well, how do you feel about the oil and gas industry? He said, well, people have to work, and, you know, my boyfriend works offshore, and, and then I kept asking them about the, their relationship with oil and gas, and finally, uh, the community worker said, you know what, um, people think this is Cajun country, and you know, they, they come down here and ask us about that, and they, and they, they blame the oil companies. He said, but, you know, my grandfather worked for, well, Texaco then, my father worked for Chevron, I worked for Chevron for 15 years before I got into community work. This is oil country. You're blaming us. How do you think we're going to react? So I think there's a myth. Yes, there are some people, but they didn't care. This has been known and published and written about. They've been interviewed since the 80s, at least. I was interviewing them in the early 80s. They just kept electing the same people. So it's hard for me, honestly, to feel a whole lot of sympathy and compassion for those folks. And I've been involved in um, uh, LA Safe, which was a great program, uh, which met with all these communities. The only ones who I really have empathy for are the Native American communities, because they were screwed from the beginning to the end. Um, their land was stolen, basically, by oil and gas companies. They didn't get the mineral rights for that. But some of the people, uh, I went to college with uh, Friends from the Lafouche area who were parents became, their fathers became, they're multimillionaires today. They went from shrimp boat to offshore work boat. You know, who could blame them? But they're some of the largest contributors to politicians today who are fighting against any changes in the oil and gas industry. So, you know, um, uh, it's hard to talk to people, and then I've had other people who said, Bob, you're right, you know, we should, and who are becoming active in these groups, in these conservation environmental groups. But, you know, that's why I have to say, you know, I keep saying we did this, we did this. I'm not saying oil and gas did it, we, we were there. We enjoyed the money. Um, we have to own this. Even if we didn't like it when it was happening, we didn't do enough. Uh, and so, you know, there's a joke I'm going to tell it. My wife's going to hate me for telling it. And I'm going to shorten it. It's a case of joke. It's about, 
the Cajun, the Cajun who had a, a pig with a peg leg. There's a, there's a Texan driving through Cajun country, and he's driving past these little truck farms, and he sees this Cajun cottage, and there's a pig walking around with a peg leg. He's got to find out about it, right? So he goes and knocks on the door. The Cajun says, "Maybe we shall, can I help you? He says, yeah, pardon, I've been driving by, and I've seen you. This pig here has got a peg leg. How'd that pig get that peg leg? The Cajun says, man, that's a good pig, child. Let me pull it. You know, just uh, last winter, we got cold, you know, the wind was blowing, and we had a kerosene heater in the bedroom. Don't you know that heater, she fall over? Poof. The kerosene spread the floor, she caught on fire. Don't you know that pig? She come running in, she smelled that smoke, she went, <laughs> She grabbed my little baby girl by the nightgown, we broke out of the house. We all got out, just then, poof. Back of the house, she caught on fire. Man, that's a good peak. Texas, a lot of cute story. Still don't tell me how that pig got that peg leg. Okay, the body, you want to know about that pig? Man, that's a good pig, yeah. You know, just last year, I'm on my John Deere tractor doing my road for the Sugar King. I mean, I make my turn in the tractor, she fall over and pin my leg. I mean, I smell a diesel coming. Don't you know, just then, poof, it caught on fire. Well, that pig, she, she smelled like fire, and she come running up and dug under there, and she grabbed me by the shirt and pulled me out. Man, that's a good pig. Texas says, look, that's another kid's story. But how'd that pig get the pig leg? The king said, man, don't you know, when you got a pig that good, you don't eat him all at one time. <laughs> that's a perfect parable. <laughs> for what we've done to the state and these weapons, right? Oh, we love, oh, I love the weapons. Oh, I love the weapons. I love the duck hunt. I like to catch my speckled trout and my red fish. It's beautiful out there. I got a camp out there. I work for the whole day. Well, you know, it says lots of weapons. We can, we can do this. We can do that. Well, not a pig's on its last leg, right? Because we can't put it together. They just kept thinking it would never end. And so now there was a piece in uh, The Guardian, I think it was, last week. The mayor of Lafitte all pissed off about people ignoring what's happening to them. Lafitte. You know, I know those people. I've fished for them most of my life. And they would laugh at me when I tell them about what's happening. So it's hard to feel sympathy for a lot of these folks. But sure, I don't want them to be hurt. I'm sorry they're getting flooded constantly, but please don't blame it on anyone else. They make always that's that's Garrett's thing now. It's the levees on the river. Well, yeah, we asked them to build it. And by the way, you can't sue the Corps for any damage from a flood protection project. That goes back to the Flood Protection Act of 1927, and that's what we learned after Katrina. So accept the damage. This is what we've done. Own it. This is how we can face the future. We've got to change the way we do business. Anyone else? Holland's been a big help for us, uh, especially after our Katrina with the Dutch dialogues. I wish we had their problem. I'm, I'm from Holland. And, yeah. Uh, what, what they've basically done out there is they've moved people out away from levees, cut the levees <coughs> off, and let the river have their way. Well, it's a much smaller country, and as the Dutch say, all moves in the same direction, right? Uh, it's much easier to get consensus. And Holland's so small that their problem threatens the whole country. You live in Baton Rouge, or Shreveport, 
or Alexandria, a town that produces people like Bob Thomas. Um, <laughs> you don't care what's happening down here. You might say you do, but it doesn't affect you. So that's the advantage. And you know, they're like 40 feet down to the Laurentian Shield. We're 400 feet of mud. So, and they didn't have the oil and gas industry come in and slice everything. So they don't have that. This story is such a fabulous story here. I was, uh, Wall Street Journal sent in some people down here. Uh, they were talking to me, and I was just trying to different layers of the story. It's cultural, it's scientific, it's environmental, it's it's economic, it's social, it's cultural. I mean, all these layers, you know, at cost purposes most of the time. Trying to get a consensus in this country on anything right now. So I really admire and wish we, you know, we, if, yeah, the Dutch, and, if, and they're, uh, with Louisiana, they're the top sellers around the world of this type of engineering. And of course, they helped us develop the urban water plan. And, and, um, yeah, we're working hand in hand. Um, so yeah, I wish, like I said, I wish we had that problem and not the one we have. All right. Thank, Thank you so much. much.